was 2013 when Victoria Milligan faced unimaginable tragedy after her husband Nico and her eight-year-old daughter Emily were tragically killed whilst on family holiday. Victoria was also left with life-changing injuries. But 11 years on, Victoria continues to use her grief to help others affected by loss after training as a counsellor. I'm pleased to say that Victoria joins us now this morning. Good to see you, Victoria. Morning, Thank you for coming hello. in. I mean, 11 years, 11 years when we say it out loud sounds like a very long time, but yeah. I wonder how that feels when you think about it. Yeah, it's so odd. It's like, in some ways, it does feel like a very long time, but then sometimes it feels like it was yesterday that it happened. And, you know, and I still can't quite believe that it happened. It was so devastating and unimaginable to have that level of loss in kind of one day, to lose a husband, a daughter, my leg. Mm -hmm. Kit was very injured as well, so mm -hmm. we had a year of trying to get save his leg as well. So it was, yeah, massive. And I think 11 years on, I kind of think, you know, I'm really proud of where we've got to. Um, I'm really proud of where my kids are. I'm really proud that I've managed to kind of bring them up as a, as a single parent, as a sole parent, um, but also still left with that sadness that Nico and Emily aren't here with us and aren't going to participate in our future and all the amazing things that happen in our future. So it's, it's always kind of a double-edged sword of thinking, proud of where we are, but still that, that huge level of sadness. Yeah. How has the grief changed as time has passed? Because I, d I don't think it goes away, it just changes. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think at the beginning, obviously, it's completely overwhelming. Mm. It's sort of all you can think about. And I think after something like that, that was very sudden, completely out of the blue, very public, it was mm. on the kind of front page of every newspaper, um, it felt... I mean, I was just in shock, I would say, for a very, very long time, actually, that I just couldn't actually quite imagine that it had happened. Yeah. And I was almost too scared to grieve. Yeah. I just didn't really know what that word meant. Like, what, what is grieving? You know, everyone's like, oh, you have to grieve. Well, yes, but at the moment, I'm just trying to learn to walk again, trying to bring up my three children, trying to get dinner on the table, you know, everything of just the normality of life. So grief for me was totally terrifying, and the pain of grieving for two very different losses, which is a husband and a sure. daughter. I mean, how... I couldn't even comprehend how to do that. It's not just one grief, it's, yeah. it's And you'd lean separate. on one for the totally. other. Totally. But and I was thinking, what if, if he was here, you know, yeah. how would we be together grieving for Emily? And maybe if only she was here, then I hadn't lost any children and I'd just lost my husband. But obviously, both of them are gone. So I'd say over the years, I think I use the analogy quite a lot of it being like a tennis ball in a jam jar, that mm -hmm. it's at the moment, it fills up your entire world, your entire brain, your entire heart, everything. It's all you can think about. And then over time, your, your life can't help but expand around that grief because life does go on. Like, unbelievably, life carries on and the clock doesn't stop. So you do meet more people, you do more things, you change careers, you move house and, you know, your life kind of expands. So after a while, that, that tennis ball moves into a, a bell jar. So it's, it's the same size, but it's not taking up as much room in your life and in your head and in your heart as such. It's, it, it's, it's extraordinary analogy. hearing you talk so eloquently as well from what you've been going through. I wonder... <clears throat> how you deal, is, is there an element of guilt as well about life having to move on? There's a, 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 the article that you did on the weekend that mm. was so extraordinary and you talked about the fact that you couldn't understand that your life had stopped but time was still ticking on. Mm. And, and there's an element, I guess, at times when suddenly you get carried over with the life and then you suddenly remember what's happened and then is there a sort of surge of guilt because you think, I don't want Nico and, and your daughter to feel like you'd forgotten mm. them and they yes. weren't still important. Yeah, no, there is definitely that. And I think there's that with the children as well, that, you know, we quite often say we still feel, feel like a family of six, but physically we're a family of four. Mm. But mm. obviously they're always going to be a massive part of our lives. And there is that element of, I think I said in the article, you know, they have no more time and we do have time. Mm. And in a way we do slightly owe it to them to carry on and live our lives to the full and, and kind of do all of that, not in a kind of cheesy way but actually do make the most of the time that we have and I think it's hard you know you said Kat about how guilt how grief changes mm. there is that thing about how do you keep their memory alive as time goes on and you know do I kids don't like being sad so it's not like I kind of go right let's sit and talk no. about daddy and Emily but obviously their birthdays Christmas we kind of get together we're very good at communicating the four of us about what should we do on Emily's birthday? What should we do on Nico's birthday? What should we do for Christmas? In a way, what would they want to do? Mm. And 
I think I dragged them all to an art gallery on about the second <laughs> birthday of Emily's after she died and we went to Tate Modern and yeah. we've gone to St Paul's, St Paul's Cathedral, it's like the biggest church in London, you know, for the biggest love that we have for Emily. And then we walked over and went to the Tate Modern and, and Olivia was kind of walking around going, she would not want to be here. <laughs> tell you that, but you see that is some great practical advice. For people, like, you know, do celebrate people's lives, do do things that yeah. either they would love yes. or they would hate. Exactly. What would be your other advice that you'd, that you'd give to somebody maybe going through a similar situation? I guess it's really kind of take that pressure off yourself mm. about what you should be feeling. You know, you can read so many books and advice about the five stages of grief and you might be, you know, feeling a lot better after 12 months or 18 months. It's kind of do it in your way and at your time and be so kind to yourself and don't berate yourself for not achieving as much as you could do before the loss because it is exhausting mm -hmm. and it is time consuming and I feel your brain is just not functioning in a, in a way that it, it was at kind of optimum before a loss and you know it is just go with whatever you're feeling at that moment and don't be scared to reach out to people and kind of say do you know what? I'm really struggling at yeah. the moment and you know, I kind of quite often say, we're not walking around with a broken arm, we're not walking around not having... Visible. You know, it's invisible. Mm. And people don't know that yeah. I might have woken up with a horrific nightmare that I had about Emmy the night before, even though it's 11 years on, you know, it doesn't go away. And I've now learned there's a handful of people that I can phone and go, I'm actually really struggling today. Mm. Can we Help go for me. a walk? Yeah. Can we go yeah. for yeah. coffee? Can yeah. we... Well, look, I know that you're retraining as a, as a counsellor as yeah. well to help people through this and, and your own learned experience. We thought it'd be, it'd be wonderful if we could get some of your thoughts on some of our viewers and things that they've contacted us with. So Victoria's gonna, gonna hear some of the, the viewers that have contacted us. So Gail, a little bit on the lines of what mm. Kat just asked you, actually mm. Gail's struggling to move on. She's lost her mum. Mm. She says, I lost my beautiful mum 18 months ago, really struggling to move on. I still cry every day. I can't seem to function some days. I miss her so much. I'm just so sad about losing her. How do I learn to live with my grief? Mm. Oh Gail, it's, you know, I'm so sorry for your loss and for, for losing your mum and, 18 months, you know, actually it's really not that long and she was your mum, you know, think about the kind of massive loss that you have had with her and I think that phrase of how do I learn to live with your grief, it, that's exactly it, it is just living with your grief and it takes time and it takes kindness and it takes support and it takes <clears throat> love and it's remembering her in any way that you can and not putting any pressure on yourself to try and kind of get over it or be better or be in a rush to kind of feel better after it. She was your mum, you know, and I always say kind of grief is the honour of the love that you had for that person and I'm presuming, you know, you loved her incredibly yeah. and she was a massive part of your life. So I think it's just stay with those days, acknowledge them, the days that you don't want to get out of bed, that you feel dreadful, it's OK, and kind of sit and maybe think about her and what you used to do together, maybe journal a little bit, remember all the happy times and the sad times that she was a massive part of your life and maybe take the pressure off. And, and I think healing happens over time and healing happens not by ignoring the grief or not feeling it, but by, by actually feeling it. And it sounds like that's really what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So I would say it sounds like you're kind of doing all the right things and in your way and in your time frame. Yeah, acknowledge your mum. Yeah, she was your mum. Yeah, you know, it is grief. sad. Yeah. Um, I've got one here from Lorraine. She says, my daughter gave birth to a baby in March 2022 at 23 weeks. Unfortunately, it was stillborn. Neither my daughter or myself were given a chance to hold the baby. We were given no support after and just sent home. Mm -hmm. My daughter now has PTSD as a result. My daughter hasn't been the same since and I feel like I've lost my own daughter as a result. She doesn't want to have another baby. I feel so bad for feeling so broken as it wasn't me who endured the pain. Do we ever heal from life-changing events like this? This is tricky because there aren't great memories to I remember. Know. And so many, I mean, that massive loss of not even knowing the child mm -hmm. and the loss of potential of what that baby could have been and what she could have grown up to, to be. And also just the really harsh and difficult way it was dealt with of no closure you know, you're expecting to have this this beautiful child and then to lose it, you know, through the pregnancy and not be able to say goodbye, not be able to acknowledge the grief, not be able to kind of live with that pain for a while and just suddenly have it kind of taken away mm. from you and kind of there you go, move on. So I think a lot of grief can be that 
acceptance and validation of this is where I am, this is where I am at the moment, and this is the loss that I've experienced, and someone else kind of being able to listen to you about this is the loss that you've had, and it is an absolute valid loss that you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And I think for the mother as well, the sadness of feeling guilty mm -hmm. that it wasn't her loss, but that is exactly what you are feeling. So I think I would say try and just not feel guilty about you feeling so sad. It's your daughter that you're seeing going through something mm. desperately sad as well. Um, and also for her to have that awful PTSD after such a dreadful experience, you know, it was last year, 18, yeah. yeah. I mean, again, it's still, I hope not that long ago, with time and communication and talking and maybe the right support and help yeah. and facing into the loss and the grief and the reality yeah. of, you know, the horrific experience that yeah. you've been through hopefully will make you both heal um, together yeah. and be able to go forward from yeah, that. Absolutely. I mean, interestingly, that question she asked at the end, do we ever heal from life-changing events like this? Uh, hopefully, Lorraine, when you hear uh, Victoria speak about her mm. experience, and that was 11 years ago and time mm. has gone on and you see where you've got to, that will give us some hope that they can yeah. eventually feel like they have got beyond it. The bell yeah. jar happened. Yes, the bell jar. That's, it was, it was a really good one. Yeah, there. I think it's a healing. You know, I don't know if it's ever healed, right. but I think mm. it's definitely an, a very much an ongoing process mm. that can be triggered out of the blue by certain things that you're not expecting or by certain big days that happen that you weren't quite expecting mm. to be triggered. But yeah, it's a, hopefully my story can give hope yes. that yeah. actually, horrific things happen in life and there is a way of human survival or whatever it is or support and work out what you need to be able to heal and have a future without those that you loved in it. Victoria, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for trying to help some of our viewers as well because unquestionably that advice uh, will land with them and hopefully help them along their Pleasure. journey too. Thank you. Oh, thank hello. You. Uh, thank you for visiting our This Morning YouTube channel. We upload tons of new content every single day. So hit the subscribe button, like all the videos and don't miss out. We'll see you in the morning.